It's time. For me to talk about CinemaSense for an unprecedented amount of... I've already said time, I don't want it to sound clunky. An unprecedented uh, quantity of minutes. As we take a deep dive into CinemaSense video Everything Wrong With Avengers Infinity War to see how much of the stuff they say is accurate and how much of it is bullshit. Welcome to part 3. If you haven't caught parts 1 or 2 yet, I'll link them on screen now. And if you have, it's time to pick up where we left off, with sin number 34. Thanos retrieves another stone. He'll be too powerful to stop. He already is. How exactly did they expect to stop Thanos, who doesn't even need Infinity Stones to be powerful, but already has two of them? Plus, Thanos needs Gamora to get the Soul Stone. Keeping Gamora away from Thanos is strategy 101, but because there's no time, they hastily conjure up some no-ass plan. There are a couple of parts to this one, so let's do them one at a time. How did the Guardians expect to stop Thanos? He's already got two of the stones, and even without them, he'd be powerful. This actually is a pretty difficult question to answer, but with the application of a new technique I've come up with called paying fucking attention, to the film, you'll notice lines of dialogue like this scattered throughout these scenes. We get it, and we can stop him. We have to get the stone first. Talking about how Thanos doesn't have the reality stone yet, and if the Guardians get it before Thanos, they can use it against him. Unfortunately, they show up a little bit too late, and Thanos already has the reality stone. But they did have a plan in mind to stop him. It just went wrong. Like loads of the other questions that CinemaSins asks, this doesn't demonstrate any kind of problem with the filmmaking, but their ignorance. Oh, and by the way, if you've noticed a slight continuity error in between this shot and the last shot in that I've changed my glasses, that's because in between the shot and the last shot... <sighs> this happened. Rip. The second part of the sin is why would they not try harder to keep Gamora away from Thanos, since Thanos needs her to get all the stones? This isn't something that's countered just by watching the film. We don't really get to see much of Gamora's decision-making process here, so it's totally valid to be asking this question. A huge amount of evidence from the film does suggest that it's a bad idea for Gamora to go and take on Thanos. Thanos even basically says he was depending on Gamora going to find him. You knew I'd come. I counted on it. There's plenty of evidence in this film that shows not only is it a bad idea for Gamora to go after Thanos, but also that she understands this. The only explanation we get as to why Gamora thinks it's a good idea for her to go and find Thanos is when she says, if Thanos gets another stone, he'll be too powerful to stop. This line helps, but it doesn't explain things like how Gamora thinks Thanos will get the soul stone without her, making this a valid thing for CinemaSins to be asking. Sin number 35. <laughs> Vision and Wanda are supposedly on the run and hiding out from, I guess, the government. But this apartment or hotel room is large as f This looks like a honeymoon, not a couple on the lam. Yeah, no, this isn't a mistake. This is showing us not only a Vision and Wanda on the run, they're also good at it. We haven't seen Wanda and Vision for a long time, so we don't know how they got into this situation. It makes sense that they would have skills in secrecy and infiltration, and that they would have money. So yeah, they're allowed to have a nice room. It contradicts nothing in the actual text. The sin just sort of sounds like it might be right, because a lot of the time people on the run are in bad conditions, which totally means that people on the run literally always have to be in bad conditions, doesn't it? Well done, CinemaSense. But basically what's outlined here isn't a contradiction of any kind, nor is it a plot contrivance in any way. It's being presented as a nitpick, but it really doesn't stand up as one. This movie, that movie. Romancing the stone! Okay, so this one's clearly just a joke. It's a bad pun based on a movie that I, surprisingly enough, haven't seen. Which, as outlined in part one, means we're just gonna strip. We're just gonna strip. <laughs> We're gonna strip. We're gonna take off our clothes now. We're just gonna skip straight past it. We're not here to assess the quality of their puns. Or, indeed, get naked. Sin to hurty Seven. Also, they went from kind of maybe flirty to kissy face hotel buddies and deeply in love, entirely off screen. This one is in this kind of weird subjective spot. A lot of people wanted a Vision and the Scarlet Witch movie to come out before Infinity War. And it's almost undeniable that if that movie did come out and it was good, it would have made scenes like this even more impactful. Now, I do feel it's worth pointing out that this isn't actually anything wrong with the movie. Vision and Wanda's arc works fine as is, so CinemaSins title purists might not like this one. However, there's nothing wrong with the perspective that Vision and Scarlet Witch should have got more screen time before this. And I'm not saying in this series that all sins have to be rigid, non-subjective criticism. If this is something that CinemaSins personally take issue with, that's okay. 
Sin 38. This series is nearly middle-aged. Look, this is the f***ing MCU. I refuse to believe anything is an accident, and I'm losing sleep trying to unravel the meaning of we will deep fry your kebab. Is it a promise? A threat? A guarantee? A cipher key? The sign is taking up way more screen space than Wanda's face. It has to mean something. The fact he says it takes up way more space than her face? Is he talking about the sign itself versus the size of her face? Actually, yeah, the sign is about, like... I would roughly, say it looks like it's roughly the size, same size as her face. <laughs> Such a strange kind of... comment. Uh, Rags has given us <laughs> an excellent comparison to be able to see if CinemaSins was indeed right. And uh, um, looks, I'm, sorry, you didn't I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, who did that? <laughs> oh, sorry, Jay. <laughs> sorry, Rags is usually the one that snaps things. Yeah, um, that's definitive proof that CinemaSins. I guess he's right, but he said way bigger, and I suppose you can say that's that's bigger. So it's on point. Now, this is another one that's in a pretty interesting spot, because first and foremost, this is another sin born out of ignorance. I, being a Scottish resident, understand that this is a joke about how people in Scotland fucking love a deep fry. I mean, while living here, I've eaten a deep fried pizza, of all things. If someone offers you a deep fried pizza, my advice would be, say yes, but make sure you're somewhere with easy access to a toilet for the next rest of your life. That thing's gonna ruin your fucking digestive system forever. But despite the fact this is born out of ignorance, I do see a difference between this and other ignorant sins. Jeremy knows he's being ignorant of the actual meaning of the sign. That's the joke. At a guess, I'd say he probably has some idea that it means this place selling kebabs will be happy to deep fry your kebab. I don't think he really thinks it's a threat. I have a very particular set of skills. I will find you. And I will deep fry your kebab. I'm sorry, I, I just really like that line. The more I think about it, the funnier it gets. It's just like the idea of we will deep fry your kebab being said menacingly. Good job, CinemaSins. In other ignorant sins, it seems that CinemaSins don't understand they're being ignorant of anything. When he says things like, How exactly did they expect to stop Thanos, who doesn't even need Infinity Stones to be powerful, but already has two of them? He doesn't seem to realize that there's something he's missing. In this case, he definitely does. So again, I'm totally happy with this one, or at least it meets my criteria. Sin 39. How the f did that alien assassin sneak up on an android without being heard or seen or sensed? And we're right back into the realm of batshit stupid sins. I, I love it. Jeremy is saying that Green Goblin here shouldn't have been able to sneak up on Vision because of three reasons. They should have seen him coming, they should have heard him coming, and they should have sensed him coming. Now, let's start with the claim that they should have seen Goblin Boy coming. I know he's not really the Green Goblin, just like I know that Cull Obsidian isn't really Killer Croc. It's okay. I'm sorry though, I should have made that joke clearer in the last one. But the reason they don't see Goblin Boy coming is that he emerges from an alleyway that they're not lined up to be able to see down. He comes from round a corner, from behind cover. This is something you can see in the clip that you show of it. Now, I know all the Vision and the Scarlet Witch's powers, uh, because I've seen all of the MCU films, but also to be sure, I looked up a list of them. This isn't the list, this is just a blank piece of paper I'm using for a prop. Nowhere on this list does it say they have the ability to see around corners. All right, now let's move on to the idea that they should have heard him coming. Well, Goblin Boy is, as you put it, an assassin. That alien assassin trying to sneak up on a high value target. How the f did that alien assassin sneak up on an android because without being he's heard an or assassin, seen or sent? You dip. I love that he actually referred to him as an alien assassin. That's <laughs> how did this alien assassin do something sneaky? How did Ezio do anything you know in the Assassin's Creed game? If Vision had gone wait, and turns and grabs this, the thing before it attacks him, he could have paused this and said, how the fuck didn't the alien assassin manage to sneak up on this robot? Goblin Boy almost certainly knew that keeping quiet is probably an important thing to do here, and neither Vision nor the Scarlet Witch have demonstrated any kind of super hearing in the MCU. They were also both very clearly preoccupied. And on top of that, even if they did hear him moving, hearing something moving isn't immediate cause for suspicion in the middle of a fucking city. Okay, now that we've established that them being able to see him and them being able to hear him are both kind of ridiculous and silly suggestions, let's move on to the suggestion that they should have been able to sense him coming. Okay, so we've covered sight and hearing. What senses do you think are left? Neither Scarlet Witch or Vision have any kind of extra senses, at least not in the MCU continuity, which is, you know, the one we're talking about. So we're left with smell, touch, and taste. Do you think they should have smelled him? What? As you pointed out, yeah, Vision is an android. That doesn't mean he has more senses. He doesn't have echolocation. He's not a bat. As far as we know. This entire sin is incredibly silly. Okay, moving on. Sin 40. We've, we've hit that barrier. The plane. 
It stopped me from facing. That's literally the only explanation this movie's gonna give for why the two most powerful Avengers end up needing help from some punchy fools like Black Widow and no longer Captain America. Now, it is absolutely accurate that this is the only explanation the movie gives as to why Vision is depowered. It's, it's literally the only explanation that Vision was stabbed all the way through the chest with a weapon that was chosen by someone who knew they were going to fight him specifically and had access to loads of different resources. Him being absolutely devastated by that is perfectly believable. But Scarlet Witch should still be totally fine, right? Why is it that she needs help? Well, the main problem she faces in this fight isn't that she's underpowered, it's that she needs to help Vision. She's able to hold her own against Proxima Midnight. Uh, no, wait, I don't want to call her Proxima Midnight, that's actually her name. We've got Squidward, Goblin Boy, and Crocodile Daddy. I think she should be female daddy. Fuck it. She's able to hold her own against female daddy, who is an incredibly powerful character in her own right. It's only when she needs to go and save Vision that she falls behind. Now, from what we've been shown of these characters, Captain America and his squad of punchy fools should be less powerful than the Scarlet Witch. However, this fight doesn't just come down to raw power. The punchy fools are able to disarm both of their opponents, something that Wanda didn't even try to do, and end up using their own weapons, as in the kind of weapon that was able to totally neuter Vision against them, while they, for the first time in the fight, are now unarmed. Armed. So in short, yes, Scarlet Witch and Vision should be more powerful than Captain America, Black Widow, and Falcon. But that doesn't mean that the more powerful characters should win every fight where the less powerful ones would lose. You have to take circumstances and the events that actually fucking happened into account. We're one away from the meaning of life and everything. Wanda is hand-to-handing this henchman. She's a magic witch that fooled all the minds of the Avengers with false visions of awful futures at once. She's not hand-to-handing you. She's, uh using a telekinesis to prevent attacks over and over again. Do you notice how they don't connect? While it is absolutely true that Scarlet Witch has been able to mind control people in the past, she's only been able to do that when she's got the jump on them. She's powerful, yes, but she's never been a totally dominating force. In the MCU, it's always been shown that her powers require focus. Her not being able to mind control Female Daddy when Female Daddy got the jump on her is totally consistent with what we've seen so far in the MCU. She probably would be able to use that power against Female Daddy, but first she's got to get herself into a situation where she's not desperately trying to fend off attacks to keep herself alive. It's the meaning of fucking life. Why does she have to throw her mind powers at people? Ever since her very first appearance in the end credits of Captain America The Winter Soldier, Scarlet Witch has always had to channel her powers through her hands. This has been completely consistent the whole way through the MCU. But Jeremy wasn't asking whether or not it was inconsistent. He was asking why it's like that, and he's not missing anything because there is no explanation for it. It's not inaccurate, and it doesn't demonstrate ignorance, but it is pretty much irrelevant. There's no reason that her powers shouldn't work like this. There's very clearly a physical element to them, and it makes sense that a way she might use them is by channeling them through her body. It's all consistent with the way it's presented to us, it makes sense in-universe that things would work this way, and there's no reason for it not to be like this. It's fine to wonder about things like this, but it's about as relevant to the story as asking, yes, Thanos is purple. But why is he purple? His dad was a grape. Now, as outlined in my criteria in part one, I'm totally fine with completely irrelevant stuff being said if it contributes to the comedy of the video. I also said that comedy is subjective, so any kind of attempt at comedy gets a pass. It doesn't matter whether or not I personally find it funny. And I guess you could call this observational comedy by a pretty loose definition, so I'm okay with this, I guess. I'll say that to me, it definitely feels like it's just here as filler, but as far as actual criteria are concerned, I think this is okay. 43 is a stupid number that no one cares about. Why did Cap need to make a dramatic entrance into this scene? And why on the other side of the tracks? I find it funnier to point out that this uh, Hellblade decides to immediately skewer this random person who's standing there. It's like it could just be some old guy like her. <laughs> she's, now, like, fucking she, die. She, she's trying She's trying to kill half the universe. She probably doesn't care. I would care about an old man. Old man are, are very... <laughs> an old man. <laughs> Now, Cap entering this fight on the other side of the tracks and making a dramatic entrance does seem to go against his motivations. He has no reason to expect that Goblin Boy and Female Daddy will just sort of gawp at him like they do, so surely he'd want to get in the fight as quickly as possible to try and protect Wanda. Well, actually, yes. This criticism is absolutely fine. You could argue that Cap is trying to create a distraction here to help Black Widow and Falcon get the drop on these two, but their attention was already focused on Wanda, so he didn't have to do that. There is more to this sin though, and after this part, it gets kind of just as good. Why isn't he helping already? And in the time it took both Scarlet Witch and Proxima to figure out who it was, either of them could have potentially won the fight while the other was distracted. This is absolutely true as well. All the combatants that were previously in the fight just start gawping at the train as soon as it pulls in. This is a point where Wanda probably could use her mind powers if she actually got focused. And Female Daddy is holding a ranged weapon and her opponent just turned her back on her. Double four. 
No, that's that's eight. Audience applause break. Another completely fair one. Cap has no reason to even be over there, let alone just slowly emerging out of the shadows like that. It is pretty clear that he's doing that for the sake of the audience rather than because it's something that he would actually want to do. Sin 45. <laughs> Guns. And another fair one. Hey, we're on a roll. That was supposed to sound natural in the script, but uh, apparently I've forgotten how to like act and, and make my words sound like it's a human saying them. Um, but there is no actual reason not to farm rhinos. They produce milk. Does the vision bat produce milk? Another completely fair sin. As Jeremy jokes about the fact that guns are pretty much ineffectual against loads of high-powered MCU characters. And in this universe there are loads of better alternatives. You know, this would be kind of equivalent to someone going to a modern battlefield and pulling out a bow and arrow- oh, wait. Someone going to a modern battlefield and pulling out, like, a broadsword. I consider this to be a fair enough joke. It doesn't come across as super serious criticism, and you know, it doesn't have to. This is fine. And it's certainly accurate enough. I mean, Falcon is using guns, and he is, or at least sort of used to be, an Avenger. I'm not really sure how the classification works these days, but you know, you know what I'm saying. Sin for Horty Six. These henchmen failed to get the stone they were sent after, and they peace out to save their own skin. And I'm pretty sure even they know that Thanos values the stones over his henchmen. So what the fuck are these minions thinking, bailing out like this? Yes, Thanos does value the stones over his henchmen, but they don't return to Thanos after this. They regroup and then try again in Wakanda. Staying to fight in this very clearly losing battle may be a good decision if it was their last stand. But after leaving here, they have plenty more options of ways to get the stone for Thanos. When they run away, they may save their own skin but they also save their chances of actually retrieving the stone. They can't retrieve the stone if they're dead. Is he, is he honestly asking why they decided to bail out instead of die? I think so, yes. That's an interesting question. That Only is an odd question. We can figure out the answer. For Sin for Haughty for even for see Stay close, check in, don't take any chances. We just wanted time. You know, to figure out the whole having sex with a synthetic vibranium body thing. It's a lot tougher than you'd think. So that was very clearly a joke. We're not really here to deconstruct the quality of the humor or the quality of the jokes. Um, plus there's no real logic to deconstruct in that joke. It's just sort of, hey, she said time. Time for sex. Like, all right. All right, CinemaSins, you, you have this one. Guys, why, why are the studs red? I hope Thanos is keeping count during all this disorder and chaos, because I can't figure out how many are dying at first glance. But I'm sure he knows how to keep the death at half season. Thanos' motivation is made very clear throughout this movie, and it's not to kill exactly half of every population he encounters. He believes that by killing half of a population, he's saving them from overpopulation and its associated resource shortages. At no point in this film are we led to believe he has some sort of compulsive desire to kill exactly half of every population. This is supported by the fact that the method Thanos uses to choose half of a population to kill isn't precise in any way. If he cared about getting anything in any way precise, he wouldn't let people choose a side. He would do the counting himself. His priority, as supported by his motivations and his actions, is to remove a large chunk of the population. He doesn't care about keeping it at exactly halvesies. This film is really missing a scene where Thanos sits down and then does some math. <laughs> He's like a calculator. Yeah, he got like a calculator. <laughs> like okay. million, I've killed 20 six, people in this battle. Um, carry the four. He's in a coma, so he's not technically dead, so that's 0.5. He's about to, like, fuck up Thor, and then Thor's like, wait, a lot of us have died already. And he's like, oh shit, really? Like, how, how many? <laughs> he's like, how many? Exactly half. He like, points oh, at him, how many? <laughs> what if there's an odd number of people on the ship? <laughs> I'm just picturing like a Thanos in like a business suit with big old glasses, just like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. He just sits down at his little desk and he's like, "All right, gonna, gonna pull out my pocket calculator, guys." So his thumbs are like bigger little, than the. Prints out a little ticket and hands it to you. He's like, "All right, I'm here." <laughs> you, I owe you two hundred lives. <laughs> like, yeah. oh, Your okay. next two hundred babies are on me. <laughs> um. That animation was made by No Consistency. They've done a lot of other stuff like that, and if you want to go and check them out, I'll put a link on screen now. We're nearly to 50. We, I think we've covered more in this part than we've covered in any other part so far. What's wrong, little one? The fact that Thanos would ever have stopped on his kill quest for even a moment because of a cute kid is a big pill to swallow. Apparently Thanos paused his kill quest to stop for a little kid, and apparently, as well, that's out of character for him. But is it? And is that even what he did? Well, when we look at 
the evidence. First of all, we already knew that Thanos was a serial adopter who would basically kidnap a lot of kids and then raise them as his own. I'd say that this strange fixation of his, even on its own, would be enough to put this action well within his character, especially considering the reason he gives that he stops for her is... What's your name? Gamora. You're quite the fighter, Gamora. He doesn't say... What's your name? Gamora. That's a lie. Your name is Cutie Pie. This isn't him stopping for, as you put it, a cute kid. This is him stopping for a kid he thinks he might be able to train, which is something we've already known for a long time that he does. We've also seen Thanos put his kill quests on hold multiple times, essentially to just test people. Remember scenes like this one and this one? I'd argue that it's totally within Thanos' character to stop on a kill quest because someone he sees interests him. But I don't even fucking have to because that's not even what he does. Thanos doesn't stop his kill quest here because he's already finished his kill quest. At the point he finds Gamora, the battle seems to be over and he's won. Not only is this sin wrong, it's wrong in basically every way it can be. The fact that Thanos would ever have stopped on his kill quest. He didn't stop on his kill quest. For even a moment because of a cute kid. He doesn't stop because the kid is cute, he stops because the kid is aggressive. Is a big pill to swallow. No, it isn't. It's all totally within his character to do this. Well, we're approaching halfway. I mean, they're actually like 120 cents, so halfway would be like 60, but we're approaching that. You're quite the fighter, Gamora. She asked a question. That's it. She's displayed zero fighter characteristics. She's inquisitive, confused, scared, guileless, but a fighter she is not. This is one of those ones that you can just debunk by like playing the scene. So let's do that. Jeremy claims she's displayed zero characteristics of a fighter, but like the only thing we've seen her do so far is struggle against a guard who's like five times her size and punch him. Or her, I, I don't know what the gender the t t t t t I might try that again. <laughs> of the two things we've seen Gamora do so far, the second being when she asks, Where's my mother? 50% of the things we've seen her do so far are fight, and yet apparently she's shown zero characteristics of a fighter. Why? I because cinema sins. Fuck it. I just like to interpret this scene as this is the death of Shrek's entire kind. <laughs> and, that's the, and that's why he's the last ogre. He had to go into the swamps because Thanos killed everyone else. In Shrek 4, we see other ogres. Um, the, those ogres are his offspring. We have. Oh, wait. I, for, I, forgot, I forgot there was like an ogre. I've I not actually seen Shrek 4. No, no spoilers, please. I, ha I haven't seen Shrek 4. You shouldn't. If I had to answer the question, what's the most, like, famous area by number, my answer would be... This half-genocide scene illustrates a curious character detail in Guardians of the Galaxy, when they told us Gamora was the only survivor. This is absolutely a loose end, and it's completely reasonable to draw attention to it. One issue with having so many different people work on the same thing, and across so many movies, is you're gonna end up with inconsistencies like this. That's not an excuse for it, but it is why it happens. I mean, look at Doctor Who. In the 70s, it was all like, weapons don't work in the TARDIS. The TARDIS is in a state of temporal grace that prevents weapons from being fired. A few moments later... BANG! <laughs> So yeah, it's a pitfall of having essentially a long-running series with a lot of writers. That's where it happens, but that's no excuse. This is fair, let's move on. Alright, now that is all the sins I'm going to cover for today, but before I end part 3, I want to make some amendments to part 2, because the point of this series is to be accurate, not just to like, derail cinema sins. The first thing I have to amend is my response to sin 17. Cap and I fell out hard. We're not on speaking terms. Really? What was that letter Cap sent you at the end of Civil War then? He specifically said if you need me, I'll be there. My response to this was to say that there are two possible interpretations of this sin. The first being that Jeremy is saying that Cap and Tony actually are on speaking terms, which I debunked in part 2. And the second, more charitable interpretation was that Jeremy was thinking about Tony's motives when saying this. That Tony is using this as an excuse to not call Cap, but Tony should know that he can call Cap because the world is in danger. I agreed and said, yes, this is something that Tony should know. The amendment that I have to make is that if Jeremy actually was thinking about Tony's motivations, he should also have realised that this should be a hard decision for Tony, as in the decision to call Cap. Both interpretations of the sin are in fact wrong. If Tony just said, yeah, okay, let's call Cap. He would have made that decision way too quickly and you'd have been like, hang on, hang on, shouldn't this decision have been, like, difficult? Tony, this is out of character for you. In this amendment, I'm changing the quality of this sin from it depends how you interpret it to wrong. The second amendment I have to make is to Spider-Man's one-size-fits-all suit or the how did Tony get Peter's measurements clip. He has the measurements of Peter, then that's it. He just, he, surely he would be able to... But that's not really relevant because this suit was built and available in Spider-Man Homecoming, and Jerry Wait, how forgot. Did, how did you get Peter's measurements? Because <clears throat> Peter is really surprised when he sees the first suit. 
Um, I don't know. I'm an... Tony's this a smart this man. Is, this is the real plot hole. Well, it's <laughs> possible that it's a one Tony size fits all, but it him. like shrinks down to his. Do we want to know look, how Tony keep... measured him? <laughs> Do we want to know that? In response to that, a lot of people brought up this clip showing the suit shrinking around Peter. Now, I would assume personally that it still has to be approximately his size to do this, but if you want to disagree, that's fine. This wasn't particularly important to any kind of point, it was just a little bit of extra fluff. And the third and final amendment I want to make is about the Iron Spider suit. Thank f***ing God Stark had pre-designed and built and voice programmed for deployment a space-worthy Iron Spider-Man suit in the, I'm guessing, a few months since Spider-Man Homecoming? I said that while Jeremy clearly hadn't been paying attention to the franchise because this suit existed in Homecoming, that there wasn't really any reason that the suit should be able to allow him to breathe in space. And for that reason, agreed with Jeremy's overall point. In response to this, a lot of people brought up Tony Stark's paranoia about aliens, and his PTSD from a space battle in conjunction with his protectiveness over Spider-Man. People also pointed out that an air supply isn't only useful in space, but like underwater and in burning buildings and stuff. Now, I will still say that I don't think Jeremy is wrong to say, thank fucking God Tony decided to make that suit, because it's not like it would have been out of character for Tony to not make another suit or for Tony to not give this suit an air supply. There were a few roads he could have gone down and this was just one of them and it's convenient that he did go down this road, so I'm okay with this sin. But the amendment is that it's much more reasonable that this suit has the capacity to breathe in space than I originally said in my previous part. Alright, and I hope you have enjoyed. I'm sorry this part was a little bit shorter than the other two, but I really do want to make sure this series is as accurate as possible and it did take quite a while to do that. Other than that, I'll see you on Sunday for another video, hopefully one about the YouTube channel up next. I'll see you then. Uh, goodbye.